coastal defence. That means to have a coastline of 4,750 miles. How is it achieved? We talk of the white cliffs of Albion, but not all of it is like that. Some of it consists of sand dunes, undulating expanses running down to the water's edge. There are estuaries stretching far inland, and there are seaside resorts, towns with promenades and piers. All of them must have their own form of defence. All of them have to be protected from the air. Britain is now ringed with anti-aircraft guns which crack into action at the first sign of aerial attack in force. As an invasion by water would probably be accompanied by intensified air assault, the anti-aircraft system with its searchlights and batteries and highly complex instruments is an important part of coastal defence. So are the fighter squadrons of hurricanes and spitfires, who from the air have opposed such attacks with glorious success. Ever memorable will be the battles over Dover, where armadas of enemy bombers and fighters have been routed when they have attacked our shipping, destroyers and balloons. of coastal defence is against enemy attack at surface level. Many German attacks against our shores never reach them, thanks to the aircraft of the Coastal Command. Aerial vigilance is one of the means by which hostile operations by sea are frustrated. Flying boats perform this job and very nobly they do it. The short Sunderland, a huge ship of the air, is a terror to any rash attacker. Its heavy protection and gun power has sent many a bomber crashing down in flames. The U-boat has been the chief victim of the Coastal Command aircraft. And when the tale is eventually told, many wrecked submarines will have owed their doom to the vigilance of these airmen. The Coastal Command works in cooperation with the Navy and with the Navy's least spectacular ships, trawlers, minesweepers and those maids of all work of the destroyers. It is the destroyers and aircraft which have the job of escorting the merchant vessels bringing Britain's supplies. The Germans have tried hard to beat the convoy system, but they have failed. As in the last war, so in this, the convoy system has proved its efficiency. Undisturbed by bombs and shells, the long lines of ships pass up the channel to our ports. that it's not easy to hit a ship on the move, able to alter course while the bomb is still falling. Our coastal defenders have also to deal with German mines. The floating magnetic mine did some damage at first, but within a few days the Navy had found the answer to it.
But there are still German mines to clear from the sea. And the job of the minesweeper is one of the hardest and most dangerous in war. Men of the minesweeping fleet take their lives in their hands whenever they put to sea. The principle of minesweeping is to take a wide sweep with wires some feet below the surface and by cutting the mine adrift from its moorings, bring it to the surface. When the mine is floating, the crew exploded by rifle fire. Back in port, they paint chevrons on the funnels to denote the number of mines exploded by each vessel. Each chevron represents so many mines. I'm not allowed to tell you how many, but I can assure you that it works out at many more times than one. Mines are a menace when laid by the enemy, but we lay our mines to protect our shipping channels. Any enemy ships making for our shores must first penetrate these minefields. The mines are laid by ships specially built or adapted for mine laying. Hundreds of them can be dropped in a short time. Publish the positions of her minefields around her coast. The mines are anchored, and should they break loose, a special mechanism renders them ineffective. Another idea in the way of defense is the boom. This is a long, strong net laid at the entrance to important harbors and estuaries, and its chief use is to prevent submarines entering the ports. But it is obviously some defense also against any ship with a considerable draft. These are the ships which lay the booms. So much for the Navy's part in coastal defense. What about the armies? Today, we have a larger army than ever before to defend us against invasion. Along the low-lying sand dunes, battalions of men who have had experience in France are waiting, equipped and ready. The big guns are in position. Strands of barbed wire represent but a small part of the defenses which we have built. And all along the cliffs and high ground, observers are watching and waiting, among them the experienced men of the Coast Guard service. The Home Guard, with its special mission for dealing with parachutists, patrols day and night ready to go into action, to picket any enemy while the message goes to the regular troops to come and clean up the invaders. We know that the army now has highly mobile units trained to surround and exterminate enemy parties. The way of the invader through our various lines of coastal defense will not be easy. When he has accounted for the Navy's mines, guns, and torpedoes, and avoided the RAF's flying boats and fighters, he must still land in the face of the Army's artillery.
man he must still land in the face of the united armies of democracy.